Well, hello everyone. Today is our last class of the semester. We've gone a long way since uh, the caves in 30,000 BC. And today we are in the 12th century AD with the beginning of Gothic. And um, Gothic architecture was the first original architectural style since, uh, well, since forever. In the 19th century, the whole idea of Gothic was given some dark mystery, some esoteric secrecy. But, um, so today we'll try to unravel some of it, at least where it concerns architecture. And we actually know the date when it began. It began in June of 1140, right here to the north of Paris, in a place called Saint-Denis where there existed an old Romanesque church dedicated to the patron saint of uh, Paris and patron saint of France, Saint uh, Denis, or in Greek Dionysus. And uh, in the early June, uh, the abbot of, uh, of that church, of that monastery actually, of that complex, whose name was Abbot Suger, he uh, in the presence of the King of France, Louis VII, and his Queen, Eleanor of Aquitaine, dedicated both the new façade and the choir of the church. Here we are, to Paris we go, slightly to the north. And here we are, the Abbey Church of uh, Saint-Denis. And here is um, the plan. The façade, very new, still, however, with the Romanesque features, as you see here, with the... Uh, the round arch, but it's a three-partite facade in a perfect cube, rather symmetrical. Two towers were planned for it, but uh, only one tower remains today, also in a rather Romanesque style, but the whole arrangement is very well organized, uh, very well ordered, almost classified, and as such, it already belongs to the Gothic age. Uh, it was Saint Denis also who introduced a rose window. This is what this round window will come to the court. And it is the window that will light up the nave. Here we have it. It has three portals. They are shallow. And uh, we saw them in Romanesque architecture with a tympano and arch bolts. The, and then, so here is, it's the west facade, as you see here, north is to our right, east is that way, and here's the west. Most of the churches oriented west-east, east, of course, looking towards Jerusalem. Today, the facade, of course, is there, and um, what's even more important is that the uh, apse is there. Suger, under his guidance, was constructed the choir and the ambulatory. The choir later on was demolished because uh, in the 13th century, when the main body of the church was rebuilt, Suger's choir was also taken down, unfortunately. But the ambulance remains right here. With the so-called radiating chapels, except here, the chapels are not so much radiating as they became as you see, part of the ambulatory. And the ambulatory now, as a result, has, um, is, uh, is too part tight and uh, allows a great number of people around the altar. And here is the uh, ambulatory as we see it. And the first thing that strikes us in this case is um, the apparent absence of walls. What we see here, we see columns, we see uh, there are smaller and larger columns, uh, thinner and, and thicker, and we see piers, we see some walls, but otherwise, here, here you can see it even better. Uh, otherwise, they're all supports. The walls, in fact, had disappeared. What we see here are compound piers, large, very thick columns with colonnettes, and uh, more elegant columns. And, uh, and compound piers are uh, done with a number of engaged colonnettes just to make them look 
less massive than they actually are. Because they are massive, they have taken upon themselves the role of the walls. Otherwise, what, what used to be in Romanesque architecture, radiating chapels, have now turned into windows, as you see it here. And this was going to be the basis of Gothic architecture, as it was conceived under Abbot Suger. He found some uh, ancient manuscripts in uh, Saint-Denis, which uh, appeared to have been written by uh, one uh, Dionysus, Areopagate, who uh, Suger, well, mistakenly, uh, thought to be the original saint, uh, Saint-Denis, the patron saint of Paris and of France. And the manuscript talked about light and how light has uh, divine qualities, how, how God is in fact manifested in light and the more miraculous light, the more astonishing the light, the, more, the, the greater the miracle. And it was with Suger that the idea of stained glass window really was given its push. Because just as incarnation happened with Virgin Mary, when Archangel Gabriel announced to her the news, the good news, uh, and the moment his words reached Mary's ear, conception, incarnation of Christ occurred in her body without destroying her virginity. It is in the same way that light penetrates a stained glass window, a colored window, and changes its essence to a different color without breaking the glass. All of that will be of great importance in Gothic architecture. And as a result, windows will be of great importance. The more windows, the better. The walls, uh, the architect will attempt to turn the walls into windows as much as possible, which of course will necessitate a great amount of support because walls must support very, very heavy masonry vaults. And uh, by cutting the walls to introduce windows, one weakens the walls. So where one weakens the walls with windows, one must support the walls with something else, with buttressing. And uh, here we have it, these, uh, the groin ribs here, as you see here, were, we saw the groin rib ribs introduced already in Saint Etienne, in Normandy, but here they were introduced uh, in earnest, everywhere. And here we have, this is a groin bolt, that is, remember, the two pointed arches, in this case, intersect one another, creating groins which direct the thrust into the corners, thus leaving the openings for, for windows, for air, for walking through. And then here's the masonry webbing and here's the diagonal ribs. Once the ribs are introduced, as you see here, the ribs take upon themselves the function of the thrust and then the masonry in between become, becomes webbing, as you see it on this, um, on this schematic. So Saint-Denis was um, 1140, its facade and its choir and ambulatory. And the astonishing thing about it was that the moment it was introduced, it seems that Gothic architecture, certainly in the north of France, just took over with the speed and power of uh, summer lightning. Romanesque buildings stopped altogether and Gothic now continued. So within five years, as you see, the, uh, this is the cathedral of Schaaf, which is also not far from Paris, and Schaaf is um, to the west, slightly to the south of Paris. And uh, today it is uh, a most perfect uh, high Gothic example of a cathedral, because it was built over a period of time, into the 13th century. But the facade was um, done in the middle of the 12th century because the old facade was burnt. At one point was damaged. The cathedral again will be burnt in the end of the 12th century, which will allow its rebuilding in a completely Gothic style. But here we see two towers. Now, originally uh, they were supposed to be similar, 
but only the south tower was completed ultimately and it's one of the most beautiful towers um, of, uh, of the period. As you see, the uh, north tower had been completed considerably later and uh, a lot of ornament by that time was added. And as such, it, uh, well, it lost the cleanliness, the rationality of the original design. The facade here, it's called the Royal Facade, it's one of the most beautiful facades. It is also three-part tight, and not only it is three-part tight, but above the facade are cut three windows here that allow light into the nave, and, uh, and a beautiful rose window that uh, has masonry with uh, rosettes, with glass rosettes. And uh, here we go to the Royal Portal. The majority of the um, Gothic cathedrals are now dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Uh, so the, the, the name of the Paris Cathedral that we hear so often, Notre Dame, we, we tend to associate it with Paris. But the majority of Goth the Gothic cathedrals were dedicated to Notre Dame and are known as Notre Dame. Uh, this, however, uh, the, um, the royal portal, it consists of... Uh, three entr entrances. The central tympanum shows Christ, the revelation of Christ, Christ in the, the mandola that we saw before, surrounded by the four evangelists, each represented by his own beast of the apocalypse. Here we have uh, Saint Mark, who is represented by the winged lion. On the other side is uh, Saint Luke, who is represented by the winged bull. Above St. Luke is uh, well, a winged eagle and, uh, who represents St. John and above uh, St. Mark is uh, a winged human form, an angel, who represents uh, St. Matthew. On the other side is the ascension of Christ here and here is um, the chair of wisdom as it is called, uh, the Virgin Mary with the child Christ in her lap, surrounded by the angel. Uh, everywhere here in, um, in arch vaults, we see uh, their angels, they're the elders of the apocalypse, they're, they're prophets, and they're, here are the apostles. On the gems, uh, we don't exactly know who these figures are, but they are most probably kings and queens of the Old Testament. As you see, the arch is now pointed because with the pointed arch, the mathematical relationship between a perfect arch and uh, the width of the doorway that depends on uh, the letter pi because, because the letter pi equals circumference of uh, a circle divided by its diameter. So they are all indelibly linked by uh, the number 3.14, approximately. That number is now removed. And as a result, one can have a more narrow doorway and a higher tympanum, or a wider doorway and lower tympanum. In other words, a great deal of uh, flexibility is introduced by removing that relationship. And thus, uh, we have this pointed arch. Uh, here is uh, the apocalypse, uh, the apocalyptic vision, and here is Christ surrounded by his beasts of the apocalypse, and uh, here are the apostles. And now we point our attention to these uh, figures that we see on the gems of the royal portal. They are entirely part of the architecture. In fact, they are so elongated, they that they, to, that they take upon themselves the look of a column, the look of the column, but not the function of a column. Because unlike the Caryatids that uh, we saw in ancient Greece, who uh, took upon themselves both sort of the appearance and the function of the columns, these do not. These are very striated, they're extremely elongated, they're almost, their folds are almost rigid, we are, to an extent, reminded of uh, our charioteer of Delphi from uh, our Greek studies. And the only imaginative uh, and, and, and the richest decoration here is, in fact, uh, the tracery 
and uh, interlace that we see in between. So thus the royal portal of Chartres. And uh, we now go to still another cathedral. We'll be traveling between cathedrals and returning to the old ones depending on what we are looking at. We go to the Laon Cathedral, which is essentially the first completely fully early Gothic cathedral. It was built in 60, in 50 years, between 1160 and 1210. And what you see here, think about our Roman Basilica, but how entirely it has changed. We do have the columns. We are back to the columns, even with uh, a degree of, uh, even with Corinthian uh, capitals, even though these Corinthian capitals are very schematic. Uh, a true Corinthian capital is, uh, it takes extremely sophisticated uh, craftsmanship to do that. These are easier to do. So here we have our naval arcade and it is with the pointed uh, windows. We have our gallery that was introduced in Romanesque architecture, as we remember. Something else now appears between the gallery and the clerestory windows, there's still another register, another row called a triforium. And originally they were called triforium because divided into three parts. It has no function, really. Uh, there's a bit of a catwalk there, I and mean, one can walk there if repairs are needed. But really its function is decorative because what the Gothic architects are trying to do is dissolve the wall all together so that we don't see masonry mass and rather see something more of a lace, of a stone lace. And that's what Triforium is for. The groin ribbed ceiling is six part tight. One, two, three, four, five, six. And as such embraces two sections in the naval arcade. And then these columns serve sort of like soldiers who direct our view uh, immediately towards the altar. And, uh, and there we see another rose window here and, um, and three lancet windows, they're called in Gothic architecture, because they, they're narrow and uh, pointed and they're called lancet windows. Uh, from Laon, we now go to Paris, to Notre Dame, and uh, you see at, in its apse the so-called flying buttresses, essentially holding up the walls. That's what they're doing, the flying buttresses. They fly between uh, a stationary buttress, very large, and uh, they go above the uh, ambulatory, and then pick the thrust just where the bolt exercise its thrust on the wall. Here it is, and uh, uh, Notre Dame, the, uh, there was another church there, and then uh, also once Gothic became all the rage, a very suspicious number of churches, in fact, around France, went up in flames. Uh, here is the facade of Notre Dame, and here we are comparing it to Chartres, and there are market, market differences. Uh, well, for one thing, it's been now about 60 years since the introduction of, um, of Gothic in Saint-Denis. Uh, now, this shaft, there are definite two towers that are articulated, whereas here, the two towers are integrated with the facade of the building. The facade appears to be a perfect square. Uh, the elevation is divided into three parts. It also has three entrances. Above the first entrance, sort of like our triforium, is introduced a gallery of the kings and queens of France. These um, sculptures were destroyed during the French Revolution. The remnants of them are in, uh, in the nearby museum, uh, the Cluny Museum across the Seine, but uh, these are copies. And then uh, on each side, there are two partite windows and a great big rose window that essentially consists of glass, even compared to the rose window in Schach, where there was as much masonry as glass, there here, masonry turned essentially into rays, right here. Then the, uh, uh, the third registry is, um, is all stone lace, 
through which we actually see the top of the roof and then the two beautiful, completely symmetrical square towers. Uh, with the Gothic, uh, order was being introduced, uh, classification was being introduced, out went the medley of uh, Romanesque, even as we saw the shot in the, um, in the royal portal, the eye is concentrated on the carving and has no chance of wondering, as it did, of course, in the Romanesque uh, portal, where there was so much represented that one just uh, was at a loss as to where to look. No longer the case. Uh, but the shot in the South Tower, what, what also makes it very, very beautiful, it begins as, uh, as a square tower, then our eye is being prepared by little half colonnettes and splaying of the sides, it's being prepared for it to turn into an octagon. And, and indeed, by the time we go, our eye looks up, it's already an octagon and we never even noticed, which is, uh, which is a wonderful, wonderful detail. But it's extremely cohesive, very symmetrical, and of course accommodates a large number of people. The, uh, the pointed arch is more accentuated than in um, Chartres, and as I said, uh, an additional register is introduced of the kings and queens before it goes into the double windows and the, uh, and the rose window. So it's very easy to see where it goes, whereas of course with, sh with Chartres the divisions are still separate of the center and of the towers. Here it's all just very unified, which of course made the uh, um, the Paris Cathedral and, uh, and its facade, so, so famous. Uh, here is the interior, uh, the map of the cathedral. It's a city cathedral, so there isn't that much room to move around. And as a result, the transept that we are used to is almost flush with the rest of the church. Uh, there are ten bays in the nave, half of it in the choir, and, uh, and, and, and a double walk ambulatory. And this is something fascinating because uh, here we are looking at the progression of Gothic and it's good to remember that Gothic became so popular and uh, so much older range. So we may almost compare it to the computer technology today. Uh, today you buy your computer, a year later it, uh, it's obsolete, if not uh, half a year later. Obviously you can still use it, but uh, the new computers will have so many more functions that one might find desirable. And here, look what's happening here. The original uh, elevation of the nave was four part -act. Here is the naval arcade. Then we have the gallery. Then, instead of a triforium, a rose window was introduced. And then the clerestory. But no sooner was it built than it became obsolete. And by now, the flying buttresses are introduced so the walls can be cut the more. And here, look at the transition. Suddenly, uh, the, uh, the rose window is now abandoned and the whole thing is cut. The clerestory window is now joined with the so-called triforium right here and the whole becomes plate tracery, it is called, because this window looks like a plate with a couple of lancets underneath it. And the wall is cut all the more and opened up for more light or for more stained glass windows, as you see it here. And instead of being a four-partite elevation, it now becomes three-partite. One, two, and three. The naval arcade, then the gallery, and then uh, and then the clerestory story that is cut further into the body of the nave. Uh, and back to Schacht we go. And uh, it does have a larger transept, as you see, with the porches. And uh, here we can compare these two interiors. The, um, and Schacht, I mean, they're all built pretty much at the same time. But uh, the moment something new is introduced and the other cathedral is thing, still being built as uh, the other cathedral's masons uh, uh, are excited by the new idea and introduce it in another cathedral. 
and here is the interior of shop and here we have we have the naval arcade then we have the uh, plate tracery and also the stained glass windows in Shah are probably the most beautiful in the world and we'll look at them of course and then the gallery is completely abandoned there's just no gallery anymore all we see here is the triforium which as I said it's not really functional except to dissolve the wall altogether. There's another difference. In Notre Dame, there's still, we still see a six part tight groin bolt. Here, one, two, three, four, five, six, that embraces two sections in the Naval Arcade. No more. In Schacht, a four part tight groin bolt is introduced, and each groin bolt, each section now belongs to its own section in the Naval Arcade. So a lot more cohesiveness now. Each also, what they attempt to do is to send the colonnades all the way up and if we can particularly see it in the cross section where the colonnades go up, turn into the ribs and come down on the other side. So the eye follows the height upwards uninterruptingly. And that was uh, another function, of course, of a Gothic cathedral for whatever reason, because practically the height was really not necessary as many people could fit into a lower cathedral as could fit into a very tall cathedral, but that uh, became uh, a, an aesthetic necessity for whatever reason. And uh, the Gothic architects attempted to build these cathedrals higher and higher and higher, perhaps to reach uh, the heavens. Uh, and here you see it how the ribs go up, then turn and split into the ceiling ribs and then go, go down. And uh, uh, it also called the exoskeletal architecture because in these parts where the bolting comes down and springs from the piers and from the columns, this is where the flying buttresses connect to the wall and assume upon themselves the thrust of the bolt, right here. In every strategic point, a flying buttress is there to hold up the wall. It's quite ingenious. And uh, here we have the six part tight bolt, as you see, that embraces two sections of the naval arcade and a four part tight bolt that embraces one section. And speaking of the stained glass windows, shocked windows are some of the oldest and the most beautiful. It is a very sophisticated technique. Uh, it utilizes primarily prime colors, and this is one of the oldest windows, and it's Our Lady of the uh, Beautiful uh, Glass. And uh, here she sits, it's the throne of uh, wisdom, uh, which means uh, the, uh, the Virgin Mary sits with Christ child on her lap, and both of them look towards us, uh, surrounded by angels. The colors are mostly blues and yellows and reds, uh, some greens, very, very bright colors. Uh, however, as you can imagine, when the light comes through these windows, it doesn't really make the interior lighter. It just sends this spectacular colored light through. But that was the purpose, because it does look magical. When the light hits, especially uh, when the sun uh, shines outside and the light plays on the columns and reflects against the architecture in all its magnificent tones. Um, the impression is spectacular. Uh, one of the most uh, famous uh, stained glass windows in um, the cathedral is the North Rose, right here. Plate tracery, as you see, and it consists of uh, well, a rose window and five lancet windows, right here. Uh, here it is, and uh, uh, there are various kings and uh, angels. Uh, the fleur de lis, the, uh, the flower, the lily flower of the kings of France. And uh, labors of the month. Here it is again. Here too are the, uh, the lily flower of the crown of uh, France. And the lancet windows in the middle is... Uh, Actually, Virgin Mary as a child sitting on the lap of her mother, Saint Anne, on both sides, King Solomon, and here is King David, 
and then here is Aaron and uh, Melchizedek, uh, the old personages from the Old Testament. Uh, signs of zodiac, uh, labors of the month, everything is in this window. And uh, Mary herself with Christ child on her lap in the middle. A Gothic cathedral encompassed the entire medieval knowledge. Practical knowledge, intellectual knowledge, theological knowledge, everything. And uh, it was a true Bible for the illiterate. One could come into the cathedral and, in fact, learn the stories of uh, the Bible. The eyesight was better at the time than our eyesight. Also, well, people died considerably younger. And as a result, their eyes held up uh, throughout their short life and glasses were unknown, so the eyes were trained to see and to understand. And thus we go to the, um, uh, to the north and south portals of Shot, and you see here, the, uh, both of them, the north uh, and the south portals were now uh, built in the 13th century as opposed to the 12th century, and the portals now become much deeper and much more dramatic, in fact. But not only that, Look at what's happening to the sculpture. This is our sculpture in the royal portal. Within a hundred years, even less, look what is happening in the south portal. Suddenly the figures begin to move. They're not an indelible part of architecture. What we're seeing here is similar to the transition from an archaic Greek sculpture to a classical Greek sculpture. Suddenly the figures are no longer stiff, they're no longer rigid, they begin to move, they, uh, they acquire life. And this is what we see here, particularly with uh, St. George here on the left. There's even a bit of a contraposto, even though it's very accentu uh, accentuated by his delt. But you see the difference. Uh, we now go to the Cathedral of Amiens, and now this one is built in the um, uh, 13th century. And you see this advance of a lace approach, of lace aesthetic. Because when you look at the Cathedral of Amiens, what you see is uh, stone lace. Uh, that's all transparent. The window now looks uh, sort of like a flame. And the uh, later style of Gothic will be called flamboyant. The middle style of Gothic will be, will be called rayonnant from the rays, from the rose window because the rays come out of the center, whereas here we see flames come out of this, the center, and this type of Gothic will be considered more ornamental, decorative. And we see it also on the Amiens Cathedral. The towers are different because they were built in different times, but up to this level, uh, it is quite symmetrical and presents a very beautiful appearance. Uh, the, uh, there's a row of windows directly above the portal, and uh, the kings and queens of France are introduced here. Uh, this is an old photograph, and it's taken uh, as, as a bird flies, and you see how much these cathedrals dominated the landscape. Uh, they were the centers of life. And they were the centers of uh, spiritual life, but they were also the centers of economic life. Uh, even though technically they did not return their investment in, uh, in financial terms. However, all human effort was dedicated to building that cathedral. An entire town would be involved. So everybody will be doing something, including lords and ladies. It was truly the center of human life in all its expression, the uh, a Gothic cathedral. Uh, the cross section shows you how logical and organized the cathedral is. Uh, these are the flying buttresses, but interestingly, one of the flying buttresses here essentially takes the role of a roof that used to be above the gallery, except now they don't have the gallery because the wall is now opened up and the roof of a gallery now is a flying buttress. It turned into a flying buttress. Uh, the pinnacles on each uh, stationary buttress uh, serve sort of as a nail, just to 
to exercise more weight still to give it more uh, mass. Uh, and here is the plan. Again, uh, the transept is not wide, almost flush with the body of the church. And while the nave has uh, two side aisles, one on each side, right after the transept, then the choir has uh, two side aisles and a very elaborate ambulatory. And here is the cathedral inside, which presents just the beautiful, beautiful view of uh, organization, of uh, uh, aesthetic uh, linearity, of uh, attempting skywards, of uh, complete logic. And uh, you see here the compound piers with their colonnades going up, up, up. And uh, again, the Clary story is now very, very long. The uh, stained glass windows were smashed during the uh, French Revolution. They were destroyed, and as a result, we now have plain windows, which of course make the interior lighter, but uh, not as magical. Still, architecture is of course magical enough. And here is the Triforium. As you see, the Naval Arcade became higher and higher. Uh, and you see here where the flying buttresses meet the thrust of the bolt. Everywhere there is a thrust, there is a flying buttress ready to pick up the, that thrust. And the, uh, the groin bolting is four part tight. Uh, here you can see how it works with all the uh, lines very beautifully, just all connected and flying together. And uh, the exoskeletal architecture here also is very much in evidence. This is a painting of Amiens, of the choir, and you can see that in the choir the naval arcade is made even, uh, even taller. It's almost as if the, uh, the bays themselves become lancet windows. And here you have it. Here is Notre Dame in Paris, and it is about 108 uh, feet. Then Chartres is already 120 feet. And the Amiens is still taller, 138. And here, this is the old shot, you see it? It's the Popartite elevation, the naval arcade, and it has columns. Then gallery, still has a gallery. Uh, rose windows instead of triforiums, and clerestory. So before that was changed. But here now, no longer a gallery. The flying buttress takes the, uh, uh, the function of the gallery and uh, triforium and very, very large windows. And same here, except everything is uh, much taller. One of the most beautiful cathedrals is Reims Cathedral uh, near Paris again. And uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a painting. Uh, and it does, as you see here, the kings and queens also became extremely tall and they are now relegated to the very top, huge rose window. Here is the real thing all LX. I mean, basically in its basic design, uh, Reims Cathedral is very close to Paris's cathedral. It has two square towers, just as Paris does, and uh, the three-part type division, but everything has turned into lace. Uh, Paris uh, was built between 1200 and 1250, but then it will continue to be built also. And, um, and here's Reims, but the facade clearly is built later, and as such, is turned into a stone cage. You can see through, you can see the flying buttresses, in fact, through these windows. It's now called tracery because everything looks like tracery. Everything looks like, uh, looks like lace. And even the pediments there, not only they have uh, uh, sculpted arch vaults, but uh, also sculptures at the very top. And as you see, the kings and queens are now much, much uh, larger. They are, in fact, uh, they're almost sculptures in the round. Not quite, but almost. And they are relegated to the very height of the facade. A huge, enormous rose window. And this is what's called reno, the, uh, the rose windows that consists of rays. Uh, here is the uh, plan, as you see it again. The naval arcade, the nave itself, only has two uh, side aisles, whereas a choir, uh, the transept and the choir almost uh, bleed into one another, 
and then beautiful, beautiful ambulatory. And here you see it. Here are the flying buttresses. Here's our pinnacles that exercise the role of, uh, of a nail. And, uh, and here's the inside. Reims is even taller than Amiens, than the Amiens Cathedral. And you see that all, every element is just being sent upwards. It meets its uh, brother, its sibling element, its twin element up above and uh, the whole aesthetic design is um, unforgettable. And you see here what uh, the rose windows do. <laughs> and then we come to Bouvet, and that's where it stopped, because Bouvet is now almost 160 feet high. So what will happen? ultimately is that uh, the nave will, uh, it begun in uh, 1225, it will collapse, uh, what, 60 years later. And uh, today all we have actually is the choir and the ambulatory bit of a transept. Uh, it looks uh, beautiful, it looks magical, it is extremely, extremely tall, as I said, but uh, we don't know why it collapsed, Poss possibly having to do, to do with the foundations, because while in, um, in Romanesque buildings it often happened that uh, the structure would collapse because everything was trial and error for the most part. Um, well, by the time, by the 13th century especially, the uh, engineers, the architects, the stonemasons, I mean the role craftsmen, uh, had, uh, had acquired enough knowledge to do things right, uh, but well, it didn't work out in the case of Bouvet, and finally the project was abandoned. But as you see, uh, lots of windows. Um, here is the uh, the inside, and here you have it. So Paris is 108, Chartres is 120, Amiens 138, and Bouvet 157 and a half. So it is the tallest Gothic structure. So Gothic Cathedral essentially became a high-rise. Uh, it's the same idea as uh, New York high-rises, uh, whose walls are done in glass. The idea was identical. Uh, nothing new under the sun. The Gothic cathedrals were very much a precursor to uh, uh, a New York skyscraper. And this is a skyscraper indeed. Look at the incredible height of uh, the Naval Arcade. Uh, many Romanesque churches could just fit <laughs> into the Naval Arcade entirely. And here, of course, what we used to call the Clara story, but it's hard to do so any longer. The ribs are so sharp, they, uh, they, begin, they, they almost look like spider's web here. And, uh, and here is our triforium. This is all the same, but in color, with its um, stained glass windows. And uh, here's the comparison. Uh, here's Bouvet, which is 157. Well, in fact, the entire Lyon can probably fit into the uh, Naval Arcade. And you see here, it consists now, even the uh, ambulatory itself has its own triforium and its own plate tracery and its own rose windows right here. And here's the difference. Uh, and the difference in um, about 80 years, essentially. But uh, as I said, with the advent of Gothic, everyone began to, to build it and uh, everyone wanted to have a Gothic cathedral. So, as I mentioned before, a surprising number of old Romanesque churches went up in, uh, in flames. Uh, and here is Reims again, as we see it uh, from the front. And uh, what we're going to look at now is uh, its sculpture and what is happening to the sculpture of the Middle Ages. Uh, we saw a bit of an advance between uh, the royal portal of Chartres and uh, its uh, side portal, how sculptures began to move. But in the case of Reims, it is all the more the case. And uh, here we have it, and it is the west portal of Reims. We have two groups here. One is the group of Annunciation, the other one is a group of Visitation. Both of them were very uh, very popular themes in, for, for artists 
And Annunciation is uh, the event that I had described earlier in the lecture about the light. And that is, God had chosen uh, this maiden, the Virgin Mary, to be his handmaiden and uh, sent Archangel Gabriel to announce the good news to her. And Archangel Gabriel uh, appears to her and, uh, and enunciates a line from Isaiah 7.14. Behold, the maiden shall conceive, and the moment these words touch Mary's ear, uh, the incarnation of Christ happens within her body. And uh, this is called the Annunciation, or Incarnation. And here we have it, here is uh, our angel, here is uh, Mary. Uh, Mary seems to be standing very calmly and receiving the news with quiet consent while the angel, well, the head actually was added later because as a result of uh, French Revolution and just age, uh, these sculptures deteriorated and uh, at certain times repairs were made so the head actually comes from a different sculpture and that's why it looks so much smaller. And here's the angel, he's smiling, he's looking at Mary, announcing his news. Usually, uh, in art, this scene is depicted as uh, the angel kneeling before Mary, who is sitting down reading a book. And that book, supposedly, is the Old Testament, as she is reading the Old Testament, uh, Isaiah 7, 14, because uh, Christianity was uh, ever eager to, uh, to find uh, predictions in the Old Testament for the advent of Christ. Uh, the other group, which is clearly done by a different sculptor, as you see here, uh, here the folds fall easily and uh, very differently from very, very busy folds of the other group, which uh, the two women look as if they are wearing the Roman togas. And the sculptures, as you see, are almost sculptures in the round. They no longer look columnar. There's nothing columnar in them and even though they yes they are slightly elongated nevertheless the proportions are much more the actual human proportions tall human proportions but uh, human proportions nonetheless uh, so the second scene is that of visitation and that is that uh, when mary and her cousin elizabeth they're both pregnant elizabeth is considerably older and she is pregnant with John the Baptist and uh, her pregnancy is about uh, half a year ahead of Mary's and they both rejoice in their pregnancy and uh, that's what the visitation is about. Here is uh, uh, Elizabeth and you can see here very clearly you see the contraposto even though the figure is uh, fully dressed however the right knee is projecting from the clothes just as you see it here and there. Not in the case of Mary, but you do see Mary's breast. In other words, one begins to see a human body underneath the garment. Needless to say, Christian church still forbids all nudity, but one does begin to see the body underneath. Whoever this sculptor was, it appears that he must have been to Rome, that he must have seen the Roman sarcophagi, he must have seen uh, figures wrapped in, uh, in their togas, and that's what he is translating onto his figures here. She is, Elizabeth, is very obviously an older woman because Mary's face is very young. Well, she was all of 14. And uh, while we don't see the pregnancy, uh, the pregnancy is hidden behind these very, very voluminous garments. Uh, we do see an incredible difference uh, between something like this and uh, the royal portal. In other words, Gothic sculpture is beginning to come into its own, is beginning to to acquire its own legs, just as the classical sculpture in ancient Greece became much uh, freer and more naturalistic than was the archaic sculpture. It's the exact same process that we see now with the Gothic sculpture. And here we see it uh, from uh, bottom up, as we would be seeing it. Uh, these figures, unfortunately, Reims was uh, horribly damaged in the Second World War. And uh, it was actually 
it was practically restored uh, from from scratch, uh, just as they are restoring today the, uh, uh, the Notre Dame. But uh, yes, it was a very very badly damaged. Uh, as we walk into the cathedral here, let me show you. Uh, in the cathedral, the uh, the Mary, the, the the four figures that we had just seen are on our left as we walk into the cathedral. But as we walk in and turn left on the wall, we see this. And these are actually figures in the round there. The, I mean, they are touched just so that they stay in place, but they are carved in the round. And uh, what we see here is, well, we don't know what we see, but uh, presumably it's the Knight's Communion before a knight goes on a crusade because he is dressed, both knights in fact, are dressed in Crusader's uh, chain mail. Here we see a priest who stands uh, in front of a makeshift altar who is offering a wafer to the knight and even though they're separated by uh, an architectural uh, device but nevertheless they're meant to be read together. And the knight is uh, slightly bowing and receiving his communion. His sword uh, has broken off but he did used to have a sword and you see here how all the figures are very much the figures in the round. So they've arrived into our classical Greece, so to speak, or similar. Now, the uh, foliage that you see here is uh, oak foliage, because what will happen with Gothic architecture is uh, they will adopt the artist, the craftsman will um, adopt native foliage for their ornamentation. Even with Saint-Denis, uh, Abbot Suget uh, contemplated uh, going to Italy as so many, uh, as so many architects had done and uh, looting Italian columns because there were so many columns just lying around. But then, um, uh, but then a quarry was discovered near Paris and uh, so the Italian project was abandoned. And uh, very often then in um, in the capitals, instead of seeing the uh, classical, either classical uh, capitals or even, oh, definitely not Romanesque capitals, those were abandoned. Uh, all that superstition was taken care of very quickly. But we often see native foliage, and uh, we see native foliage here in this case. In this case, these are oak leaves. And then um, we go back to Paris itself. And uh, in the 13th century, um, its king, uh, right here in the uh, middle of the century, uh, whose name was Louis the Ninth, and uh, or who would also be known as Saint Louis, as Saint Louis, because he had gone on all sorts of crusades, all of them disastrous. But nevertheless, he was known as a very saintly person, as a very devout person, as a good king, and as such will be known as Saint Louis. He was given an opportunity to purchase for an enormous amount of money a part of Christ's um, uh, crown of thorns uh, via Constantinople and uh, via Venice. And uh, in order to house this extraordinary relic, he built a reliquary, but not just a small reliquary that usually holds relics, but a building that looks like a reliquary. And here it is. It is a very small building and it doesn't have side aisles, so it didn't need uh, flying buttresses. It's not incredibly tall, even though it looks it, because of its design. But these, um, these adjacent large buttresses served the purpose. And the whole thing, as I said, looks like a treasure box, a treasury box, like a little reliquary. Uh, it is called Saint Chapelle. Uh, uh, a holy chapel and uh, at the time it was surrounded by a royal palace and this is where kings used to live before later on they will build uh, a Louvre for themselves and then uh, in the 17th century of course Versailles under, under Louis the 14th but the kings used to live here today these buildings are the French just justice uh, ministry and uh, Saint-Chapelle this is the interior its stained glass is uh, second only to Shaf. It's, uh, it's an amazing place. It's, uh, it's a very magical place. One walks in 
And uh, she said, this is the original uh, reliquary where the crown was originally held. The ceiling is blue with, uh, with gold stars, and uh, the walls are made of stained glass windows. Here is uh, another, uh, another image as you look up at the ceiling and you see the same full partite uh, groin vault that embraces each bay. Here are these absolutely magical windows and needless to say in normal times. There are concerts given in the chapel all the time and, uh, and the acoustics of course are magnificent and uh, it's all very very magical. And uh, here's the rose window that you see here. And there it is. Uh, here's still another, another image of the same. Still another image. Yeah. It's um, all the images. There's never enough. Uh, here's where the crown was originally held. And this is the crypt. And uh, the, um, the crypt is also... Very, very lovely. It's low, of course, and it doesn't have that many windows, but uh, the walls are all wrought in, uh, in design. It's, uh, it's been a little over-restored, but it's still very, very lovely. And the walls are decorated with the lilies of France and with uh, the Gothic arches, also a magical space. And last but not least is a beautiful, beautiful church in saint Maclou, it's uh, in the north of France, and this one has already been built between the 15th and into the 16th century. I mean, Italy at this point is uh, full thrust into Renaissance. Uh, Donatello is sculpting Renaissance sculptures, Brunelleschi is building Renaissance building, the north is still Gothic, and frankly, the north will be Gothic for a long time, and uh, and later on, other countries, of course, will embrace Gothic as well. Uh, it's a little church right here, and uh, I'm showing it to you how, just to show how in incredibly lace-like it is. I mean, this is what Gothic, the original Gothic, was all about. The facade now is, in fact, convex. Everything here is bursting in stone flames. And you see here how when it's lit up, you can essentially see through it. And, uh, and that's what the original Gothic uh, goals were all about, French Gothic. Gothic, of course, will extend everywhere. The Italians will never quite accept it, will always adopt it to the Italian modes. The English will love it, but they'll never care, care for the heights, they'll never care for too many windows, uh, they'll adopt the stylistic uh, details of Gothic rather than its functional details. And the same will happen in Italy. Well, Italians love their wall paintings too much to get rid of the wall. And, uh, but uh, we see the English Gothic, we see it in the Houses of Parliament, we see it, of course, in the Oxford Cambridge University, we see it in Princeton as the result but these are all now the domestic application of the Gothic style. Um, the Gothic principles, when they were established, were about the dissolution of the wall and introduction as um, much window space as possible. Well, we are at the end. I, um, I hope you have wonderful holidays. Christmas, New Year, delightful winter break, and um, stay safe.